and welcome to Leadership Table Talk, a show designed to help you develop and improve your leadership skills and talents. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Gillum. In case this is your first time watching the show, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. A graduate of the McDonald School of Business at Georgetown, I'm the owner of Executive Leadership Enterprise and Management Services. I'm also a retired Air Force Colonel and former member of the Senior Executive Service or SES Corps with the Department of Defense at the Pentagon. An avid writer, I am an Amazon number one best-selling author of 13 books and the inventor of the new leadership board game called The Leadership build zone. In today's episode of Leadership Table Talk, I want to challenge you to release whatever baggage that may be disrupting your ability to lead. To help you with that process, I will be discussing five things that can produce barriers to effective leadership. So if you're ready to learn, let's get started. In my latest book, How to Lead Without Alienating, Bullying, or Destroying Your Team, I address the problem that arises when 51% of workplace bullies are bosses. This is a horrible statistic, and that is why I wrote the book. I want to provide leaders with strategies, tools, and techniques to help them to avoid the toxic behaviors that cripple teams and destroy organizations. One of those toxic behaviors that I like to discuss right now is this, obsession with power. And to help with that, I'm going to be reading from the book, A True Story, in which this particular boss truly was obsessed with power. And the story goes like this. Monday began as a great day. I was excited to start working with my new client. As I approached the office complex, my tranquility was dashed by a loud voice thundering through the hallway. Get in here now, screamed the irate and agitated man. I need those figures. What kind of staff are you? Are you too dense to understand deadlines? Sprinkling a few explicits throughout the one-way conversation, he continued his rampage on his staff. Toxicity filled the air. You could have cut the tension with a knife. Papers being shuffled and people hustling. Everyone was scrambling to get to the meeting. Despite the emotional turbulence, it was apparent that no one wanted to be late. Shocked and confused, I whispered to the receptionist, who is that? And does he act like that all the time? To my dismay and horror, the receptionist replied, he is one of the directors. And yes, that is his normal behavior. This man is what I call the mad director. So let me ask you something. Does power corrupt? Or is it that power in the hands of a corrupt individual is the problem? Because you see, power in and of itself is neutral. But when you put power in the hands of somebody who is really obsessed with power, then you're going to have some problems in that organization. And so obsession with power is one of those things that can disrupt your ability to truly be an effective leader. So now let's take a look at another thing that can do the same thing. And that is this, inability to listen. In my book, I talk about different models. And one of the models that I talked about from the listening perspective is the 3L listening model. The 3L stands for listen, learn, lead. I firmly believe that if you do not have the capacity to listen, then you cannot learn so that you can be the leader that your organization needs you to be. And in the book, I give six different tips for effective leadership. 
And so I'd like to just uh, share those with you in terms of effective listening, that is. Number one, you want to be a leader who listens with what I call open ears and committed eyes. No wandering looking around because you see, this is what happens. You know, when you are talking to somebody and you can see whether or not they are paying attention to you because their eyes are wandering and they're like, okay, can we just get this conversation over with? That's not effective listening. So you want to listen with open ears so that you can hear and understand and you want to commit to the person that you are listening to. Number two, do not be judgmental. Refrain from being judgmental because you're in this conversation so you can learn something. So you can't be, you can't learn, in other words, if you're being judgmental. So you want to refrain from being judgmental. Number three, clarify to understand. And you may say, Dr. Keller, what do you mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. Okay, suppose your name is Charles, for example. Charles, just to clarify, I believe this is what you said. Am I correct? Because you see, you want to make sure that you have heard Charles correctly. And so if you look to clarify what you heard, then that would make the conversation go a lot further. Number four, don't allow body language to send negative negative signals. Have you ever seen people standing up here like this? And, you know, have you ever also saw them and, and they couldn't wait for you to stop talking because they had to get in whatever it is they wanted to say? So those are signals that says you are not effective at listening and you may need to develop your listening skills. And so you want to make sure that you don't do that because that definitely sends the wrong message. Number four, and these are six tips for effective listening. Don't commit to listen if you don't have time to hear. You know, if, if you tell me uh, we're gonna come in and talk about this particular issue, I expect that you have time for me to present my case, whatever it might be, because if you don't, then maybe we need to reschedule it because sometimes you may or may not have time to do that, but if you have time, try to reschedule so that you can make sure that you commit to listen to the person, you give them the time necessary, and you're not just rushing through this conversation because you're not really listening in that regard. So the one that we're going to look at now is number five, and that is don't commit to listen if you do not have time to hear. And you may say, Dr. Gillum, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't know how many times I've gone into meetings that were scheduled, and for whatever reason, my bosses really did not have time to really listen to everything that I wanted to present. And, and that's the problem because if you do not have time to hear what is being presented, then maybe it's best that you reschedule the meeting and not try to rush through because if you try to make decisions and you don't have all of the information that you need to make credible decisions, then that's not a good thing for a leader. So you always want to make sure that if you're going to schedule a meeting, have time to really hear, commit to hearing what is actually being presented to you. So that's number five. So number six is this, remain objective and not critical. Sometimes you may say, oh, I, I really disagree with what this person has to say or what they presented. Well, that is your prerogative. You can do that, but you don't have to be critical. Always try to stay on the message. Never become critical because a lot of people, you know, they will start criticizing the person and you never want it to make it personal. You always want to make sure that if there's a, a different opinion, be open to that because that's the art of listening. Don't be the kind of person that I know everything and you can't tell me anything. No, be the kind of person who really wants to develop the art of listening. Okay, so I believe this. Leaders who practice the art of effective listening are more apt to make decisions 
based on informed data and not personal bias. That's why if you are guilty of inability to listen, then I want you to, really, to release that. <laughs> Don't hold on to it, but release it, okay? So now let's take a look at another uh, item that can uh, prevent you from being the kind of leader that you want to be, and that is this, the inability to receive constructive criticism or feedback. Have you ever met people that, oh my goodness, you, you can't tell them something that they did wrong because they will become very defensive? That's not good leadership because great leaders always recognize that there are going to be times that you're going to just get it plain old wrong. But you have to be willing to receive constructive criticism or feedback about that particular decision because more than likely you're going to probably get it from your boss and then you may just get some feedback from those that work for you because there are bosses who they may not have uh, taken the advice of someone on their staff, but they will find out later that that person was correct or the team was correct. Well, you need to be the kind of person who can receive constructive criticism as long as it's given in the right frame of reference because there's a, that's another conversation where when you give people feedback you have to make sure that you do not attack the person but you are staying on the message itself and so but as a leader you definitely need to develop the skills necessary to be able to receive constructive criticism or feedback Okay, so that's number three in terms of those things that can disrupt your ability to lead. So let's move on and look at number four. Number four deals with failure to change. I want to discuss this from three different perspectives, and that is from you, the person, your team, and then the organization itself. So let's take a look at this. You, as a person who doesn't like change, you may be the kind of person that says, oh, we've always did it this way, so why do we need to change? But you may be making decisions off of something that you learned 20, 30 years ago, and time changes. Things change, technology change. So you have to be a lifelong learner and you have to also be willing to educate yourself so that you can stay uh, abreast of what's going on so that you can make informed decisions. So you cannot be reluctant to change you as the person, the leader. So now let's take a look at your team because if you are reluctant to change, are you then being a stumbling block in your organization versus being the kind of person who will promote innovation? You need to ask yourself that. Are you that kind of person that's more of a stumbling block then you are being a help, a value add to your organization. So let's look at number three, stagnant organizations. They don't grow. There are a lot of organizations, unfortunately, that remain stagnant and they're no longer around today. You know, we can just rattle off a bunch of them that are no longer relevant because they chose not to change. And if the leader who's in charge of that organization or that business has that kind of mindset that you want to stay where you are, then you're not gonna be in business long because you have to change. You have to be that kind of person. And in the book, uh, How to Lead Without Alienating, Bullying, or Destroying Your Team, I introduce a concept that I developed and it's called Full Throttle Leadership. And I want to share that with you because that can really help leaders who have a problem moving forward in terms of change. So what is full throttle leadership? I want to share that definition with you. It is proactive behaviors or measures that take an organization from ground zero to the right elevation at the right speed and for the right purpose with precision the leader moves the organizational needle from a place of independent action to one of team action. Full throttle leadership. That's the kind of leadership that you want. 
And so let's just dive a little bit more into that because you know, like with everything, there has to be an acronym. And so I just wanna take a couple of minutes to share a little bit of that with you. When it comes to full throttle leadership, the F is for fearless, willing to take charge and disrupt behaviors that are sabotaging the organization. U is for unity, willing to bond together to create a winning team versus operating in independent silos. And then we have the L, which is loyalty, willing to defend what is right for the organization, and more importantly, is number one resource, and that is the people. And then the other L for full stands for this, likable, willing to work hard, to create a work environment in which employees enjoy coming to work. There's nothing like going, coming to work and you do not like the person that you're working for. So as a leader, you wanna try to create a likable uh, organization, be that kind of person that people don't mind working for. And then we look at throttle, the T itself. T stands for thankful willing to thank and recognize others before he or she showers down rewards on themselves. Wow, being thankful. And then the H in terms of full throttle stands for this, honesty, willing to engage in honest behaviors and promote them throughout the organization. So R, respect willing to extend to others the same level of deference or adoration that he or she expects in return. Can you imagine that? Leaders who respect those that work for them, with them. Oh, being open-minded, willing to refrain from being closed-minded so that you as the leader can learn new ideas and gain different perspectives from a diverse workforce. And then we have the T, teachable, willing to maintain a teachable spirit. Leaders who are unwilling to learn from others will become blinded by their own unwavering mindset. And then let's look at the other T, transformable willing to transform from non-productive leadership behaviors to time-proven team-building behaviors that unify and strengthen organizations. And then let's look at the L, listener, willing to listen, willing to listen. And then the E for full throttle, the E is this, encourager willing to encourage, inspire, and motivate others to become the best that they can be. Full throttle leadership is what we need in organizations today. And so let's look at number five in terms of those five things that can cripple you as a leader, disrupt your ability to lead. Number five is this, inability to cope with emotional chains. And what are some of those emotional chains? Let's take a look. Chain of inadequacy. Feeling like you are not good enough to be in the position that you're in. Because if you constantly think that, that's how you're going to act. That's how you're going to be perceived. So you have got to release that chain of inadequacy, feeling like you're not good enough. You would not be in the position if somebody thought that you were not good enough to be there. So you have to break that chain, that thought process, that mindset that says, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough because it will be perceived by those that work for you how you perceive who you are as a leader. And then you have the chain of unforgiveness, vindictiveness. I've known a lot of people who were mistreated by their bosses or a peer or a coworker or something. And when they got elevated to leadership, you know what they did? 
they took that same chain of unforgiveness, vindictiveness, and they began to act through that. They began to see things through those lens. That's not good leadership. If you cannot forgive that person and move on so that you can set the right example for those that are looking to you for solid leadership, then you need to step down. Being a leader is not in your DNA because that's not right. That's not the way to lead organizations that you want to last and even outlast you. But you as the leader, you set the example. And if you go around, because there are people who they will tell you, well, when I step up, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And a lot of it has to do with being vindictive because now I have the power, I can do it. And that's not right. That's not good leadership at all. And then you have the chain of chaos the chain of chaos. And this, these were all under the umbrella of inability to cope with emotional chains. And so the last chain I wanna talk about is the chain of chaos. So what does your morning routine look like? Before you walk out the door, do you spend a few minutes maybe asking God to help you to make the right decisions as you go uh, about your day? In terms of you walking into the office so that you are at peace, you are calm. Because imagine if you have a bad morning and as soon as you walk out the door and you walk into your office and something goes wrong, you're going to go full speed ahead and you're going to say some things that you wish you had never said. Because if you are already stressed, then somebody saying something to you is only gonna make it worse. And they're not going to know that maybe you had experienced something at home or something like that. So that's why you have to make sure that you have those filters in place. Maybe take time out to reflect before you walk out the door during the morning so that when you go to work, you're prepared, you're prepared to lead and not do something or say something that you will regret. And you know, I often uh, talk about this in a lot of uh, presentations that I give when it comes time to uh, maybe say, uh, give some bad uh, information that may not necessarily be something that a, another person want to hear, but you have to give that uh, information in terms of maybe conducting a crucial conversation. And uh, so I often tell people, as I did in the book, I said, there's something that you may want to do, a process that I love to tell people about, and that is this. You want to think about what it is that you want to say, and then you may want to take the time to write it down. And then after you write it down, you want to be able to uh, maybe go back and edit it. And then you may want to rethink what it is that you want to say. Because a lot of times when, when I often tell people this is that on every end of a conversation, there is a real person. It's not a robot. It's a real person. So whatever it is that you want to say, especially if it's negative information, you know, do the right thing there. Don't just go and you know, blurt something out and, and all of that because you forget that that person has feelings. And so that's why maybe you want to think about it, edit, rethink it, and then say, okay, now, should I even send this? Because sometimes people will send stuff via uh, electronic means when they should have maybe met with the person in person and delivered the information that way. So that's why you need to really think about what it is that you're uh, saying to people, especially if it's something negative and you have to uh, tell that. And so, what I also tell people is that communications, 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 always make sure that um, when you are communicating with someone that they have fully grasped what it is that you wanted to say. And you may just need to take time out to craft the message and to present it in a way that it is understandable to all that will hear that particular message. Because we all know communications is key. A lot of organizations fall by the wayside because people fail to communicate with those that work for them, with them, and who they work for also. So when it comes down to releasing the kinds of things that can hinder you from being a good leader, 
I, I want you to do something. Imagine if you were here in the studio and, and I told you, what is it, or I ask, what is it that you want to get rid of, release? I want you to pretend like every one of the things that I talked about, those five things that we just uh, talked about, obsession with power, I want you to release that by doing this and putting it in the basket. And so then number two, inability to listen. We are releasing that and we're gonna do this to it and put it in the basket. Number three, inability to receive constructive criticism, feedback. No, we're not gonna continue to go down that path. We're going to release that so that we can become more effective leaders. Number four, failure to change. No, we're not going to be caught up in that, but we are going to be change agents. So we're going to release the failure to change thing that will hurt us. And then number five, it's this one, inability to cope with emotional change. And so that goes in the basket as well. And so I hope that you've got something out of this presentation today because it's all about helping you to grow and develop as a leader. And so if you'd like to know more about me or my book, uh, How to Lead Without Alienating, Bullying, or Destroying Your Team, please go to my website, executiveleadershipbiz.com. The book itself is actually on Amazon, but if you like to just find out more about my business, go to executiveleadershipbiz.com. This is Dr. Mary Gillum. I hope that you have been inspired again, and so I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.